Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background. My name is Karen Pascal. I'm with the Henry Nowen Society. Um, and we shared last night how this conference has been a real collaboration between Dr. Paul Pearson from the Thomas Merton Center, uh, Jim Hackney from, uh, and Dean Greg Sterling from the Yale Divinity School and the Henry Nowen Society. It's been a coming together of many good things and, and we're just delighted. You missed one lovely little treasure last night. We had Sue Mosteller, Sister Sue Mosteller gave us a call to conference and it involved tuning your spiritual GPS to basically hear the directions that God has for your life out of this day, out of this gathering. So I would encourage you all to do just that. And in order to do it, why don't we just have a moment or two of silence right now where we really ask God to quiet us and we take a moment to listen. And then I'm going to introduce our speaker. As Paul Pearson uh, of uh, the Thomas Merton Center and James Hackney of YDS and myself from the Henry Nowen Society planned the event, we wanted to be sure we would find speakers or subjects that would bring together both Merton and Nowen. And we agreed that Robert Ellsberg would be an excellent choice. Robert has served for 30 years as the editor-in-chief and publisher of Orbis Books, where he has written and edited a number of award-winning books, including the three-time Catholic Press Associate Award winner, Blessed Among All Women. Robert met our criteria because he has published many books on or by or about Thomas Merton and Henry Nowen. Robert came to know Henry while serving as the managing editor of The Catholic Worker in the late 1970s. They overlapped at Harvard Divinity School where Robert received a master's degree in theology and later Robert and Henry collaborated on a number of books. He was a trusted editor and friend who worked closely with Henry Nowen in his last years. After Henry's death, Robert served as one of the trustees of the Henry Nowen Literary Estate. As a publisher, he brought such wisdom and experience to that role. Together with Sister Sue Mosteller and Nathan Ball, they addressed many of the issues that arose around this huge legacy of work entrusted to their care. More recently, Robert has edited several books by Dorothy Day, including her letters and diaries. His books include All Saints, The Saint's Guide to Happiness, and blessed among us. He's also served as the general editor of the Orbis series, Modern Spiritual Masters, and has edited volumes by Thich Nhat Hanh, Flannery O'Connor, Charles de Foucault, and Carlo Caretto. All Saints. Well, that's one of my personal favorites, I have to admit. I, fortunately, you gave me a copy, and I just love this book. And every single day, you meet another saint. But I want to have some of the things that have been written about it. I want to share that with you. Henry Nowen wrote, this book is a treasure. I consider Robert Ellsberg to be one of the most significant spiritual writers in the United States. And this book 
puts him right in the center of contemporary spiritual literature. Jim Forrest, who you'll be hearing from later today, wrote about this book. Each entry has a rare gift for getting, oh, sorry, each entry in All Saints is as crisp as freshly picked lettuce. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Robert Ellsberg has a rare gift for getting a great deal into a small space and always getting what matters. I would agree, and because of this, I anticipate today that as Robert speaks to us about the home where I have never been, the restless journeys of Thomas Merton and Henry Nouwen, he is going to give us what matters most. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Ellsberg. Thank you so much. I, um, that takes me uh, uh, back uh, a ways. Henry uh, he wrote that fulsome uh, praise of my book. I think after I'd sent him an entry for uh, Vincent van Gogh to appear in my book of saints, and I think that I had him from that. Uh, I remember, um, well, it's amazing for me to even be here thinking it was 40 years ago when I first met Henry. He was a professor here at Yale. I was a very young editor of The Catholic Worker, and he invited me uh, to one of those gatherings at his, his home that uh, Jim described last night, where he proudly uh, displayed his culinary gifts, which consisted of mixing two different kinds of tomato, Campbell's tomato soup uh, together. It was his, his own recipe, he'd invented that. <laughs> Let me go back a little farther. In 1968, as Thomas Merton embarked on his journey to Asia, he wrote in his journal, may I not come back without having settled the great affair and found also the great compassion. I am going home to the home where I have never been in this body. Merton had to spend his early life on a grand tour that took him as he summarized in the final paragraph of the Seven Story Mountain, quote, from Prague to Bermuda to St. Antonin to Oakham to London to Cambridge to Rome to New York to Columbia to Corpus Christi to St. Bonaventure to the Cistercian Abbey of the poor men who labor in Gethsemane. And the implication was that that was the, the final resting stop. To what purpose? He answered that implicit question in the words of God that you probably remember, that you may become the brother of God and learn to know the Christ of the burnt men. Though he remained at the Abbey of Gethsemane for the last 27 years of his life, that was certainly not the end of his journey though now more interior than geographical. He acknowledged as much in the Latin motto that concludes his autobiography, sit finis libri, non finis quarendi. Here ends the book, but not the searching. Truer words were never spoken. In fact, Merton's life continued to be marked by a restless search that continued until his death. In his struggle to plunge deeper into the divine mystery and the depths of his own vocation, he traveled onward toward his true home, the home where he had never been in this body. In 1995, Henry Nouwen set off on a sabbatical journey from his work as chaplain to the Larche Daybreak community in Toronto. He had also lived in many places, his native Holland, the Menninger Institute in Kansas, Notre Dame, Yale, the Abbey of the Genesee in New York, a mission parish in Lima, Peru, Harvard Divinity School, Trolley, France. A great restlessness drove him from one place to another. Only in the last 10 years of his life at daybreak did he find something that felt pretty much like home, and yet this did not resolve the restless search for peace, for a sense of belonging, or what Merton called the great compassion. I think that both Merton and Nowen, as spiritual explorers, came to a place of recognizing that there is no final destination in this life. Their home was the journey itself, a journey that would never be entirely completed in this body. In his final journal, Nowen wrote about the little while of our lives, such a precious time. Quote, it is a time of purification 
and sanctification, he wrote, a time to be prepared for the great passage to the permanent house of God. In the end, neither Merton nor Nowen returned from their final journeys, but I think each of them, in their struggles to remain faithful and to trust in God's loving providence, opened a path to holiness for all those who struggle amidst life's doubts, unresolved questions, and uncertainties. Merton first came to the attention of the world in 1948 through the publication of his book, The Seven Story Mountain, the autobiography he wrote in his early years as a Trappist monk. It told a story by turns funny and sad of his search for his true identity and home, of his orphaned childhood, his education in France, England, and New York, and of the pride and selfishness that brought nothing but unhappiness to himself and others. And he told how his search had led him ultimately to the Catholic Church, and finally on the eve of World War II, to the Trappist Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. On viewing the silent monks dressed in their white habits and kneeling in prayer in the chapel, Merton had exclaimed, this is the true center of America. In entering the monastery, Merton not only felt he was leaving the world and giving up everything, he was also leaving behind a certain Thomas Merton with all his anxious desire to be somebody, his demanding ego, his tendency to sarcasm and scorn for people who didn't meet his standards. With the anonymous monks in their white habits, he intended to drown to the world, to be invisible, a nobody. It didn't quite go that way. The Seven Story Mountain turned out to be an astonishing bestseller, selling 600,000 copies in cloth in the first year. Merton was suddenly the most famous monk in America, an irony that was not lost on him. And yet his superiors felt his writing had something to offer the world, and they ordered him to keep at it, and so he did. And there followed books of poetry, lives of Trappist saints, which he later termed awful, books on monasticism, and an increasing stream of books on prayer and the spiritual life. If he ever doubted whether he was truly a monk, there was never any doubt that he was truly a writer. Yet for all the books he would go on to produce, in the public mind, he was eternally fixed at the point where his memoir ended. As a young monk with his cowl pulled over his head, happily convinced that in joining an austere medieval monastery, he had fled the modern world never to return. It was difficult for readers to appreciate that this picture represented only the beginning of Merton's journey as a monk. One aspect of the book that he particularly came to regret was the attitude of pious scorn directed at the world and its unfortunate denizens. He had seemed to regard the monastery as a secluded haven set apart from the, quote, news and desires and appetites and conflicts that bedeviled ordinary humanity. In 1948, an errand into Louisville occasioned one of his first trips outside the monastery in his journal, he noted piously, going into Louisville the other day, I wasn't struck by anything in particular, although I felt completely alienated from everything in the world and all its activity. Though he felt the people were, quote, worthy of sympathizing with, overall he judged the excursion boring. What a difference a decade would make. Ten years later, in 1958, he records in his journals the radically different impact of another errand into Louisville. Quote, on the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, an intersection that has recently been rechristened Thomas Merton Plaza, he experienced a moment of mystical awareness that inspired one of the most famous passages in all his books. He writes, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien, alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like wake, waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. The whole illusion of a separate holy existence is a dream, not that I question the reality of my vocation or of my monastic life, but the conception of separation from the world that we have in the monastery too easily presents itself as a complete illusion the illusion that by making vows, we become a different species of being, pseudo-angels, spiritual men, men of interior life, what have you. This passage ends with the marvelous words, there is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. There are no strangers. 
The gate of heaven is everywhere. I want to underline those words. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. In that dream of separateness, he is describing an understanding of holiness that had animated his early life as a monk. That is an understanding of holiness primarily defined by ascetical self-denial. In its place comes an understanding of holiness based on compassionate solidarity with his fellow human beings. And Merton came to see that the entire purpose of the monastic life, or any spiritual search for that matter, was to achieve this vision, this awakening from a dream of separateness, to realize our underlying oneness, our unity in what he called a hidden wholeness. No doubt this marked a crucial turning point in his evolution as a monk. For years, Merton had devoted creative thought to the meaning of monastic and contemplative life, but from this point on, he became increasingly concerned with making connections between the monastery and the wider world. His writing assumed a more ecumenical and compassionate tone. Reading his old writing, he observed, I cannot go back to the earlier fervor or the asceticism that accompanied it. The new fervor will be rooted not in asceticism, but in humanism. For Merton, it was a kind of rebirth. I am finally coming out of the chrysalis, he writes. Now the pain and struggle of fighting my way out into something new and much bigger. I must see and embrace God in the whole world. Along with his writings on prayer and spirituality, he began to write prophetic es is essays on the issues of the day, including the Cold War atmosphere of fear and the threat of nuclear war. Not everyone, to be sure, was happy with this new Thomas Merton. They preferred, quote, the official voice of Trappist silence, the monk with his hood up and his back to the camera, brooding over the waters of an artificial lake. <laughs> the new Merton, he wrote, quote, was not the petulant and uncanonizable modern Jerome who never got over the fact that he could not give up beer, that he, that he could give up beer. To this, he added words intended to shock his pious devotees. I drink beer whenever I can lay my hands on any. I love beer, and by that very act, the world. And yet he believed his love for the world implied a prophetic stance, a need to criticize its spiritual delusions in collaboration with other like-minded social critics and spiritual seekers, quote, to make the world better, more free, more just, more livable, more human. While some of Merton's readers wished he would stick with the old writing on the liturgy and prayer, there were also many new friends who wondered what he was doing holed up in a monastery. Wasn't this life of prayer and solitude a cop-out from the more relevant action in the streets? For Merton, this never posed a serious temptation. In fact, his increasing engagement with the world outside the monastery was accompanied by a deeper call to solitude. Monks in the Benedictine tradition, including Trappists like Merton, take a vow of what is called stability. In a literal sense, this is a vow to remain in the monastery to which they are attached. It's a commitment not to run away when things get tough or to imagine that life will be easier if you just didn't have to put up with all the idiots around you. What disturbs you is inside you. If you leave, you'll just take it with you somewhere else. But there is a deeper principle than just staying put. Contemplating the vow of stability is a second Benedictine principle called conversatio morum, literally the conversion of manners. Essentially, it refers to the ongoing process of growth and spiritual maturity, going deeper into the heart of your vocation. The task of becoming a monk doesn't end when you take your vows. That's, it's an ongoing journey that lasts a lifetime. There's no doubt that for Thomas Merton, the vow of stability was a particular challenge. In his early book, The Sign of Jonas, he describes stability as the belly of the whale, the mysterious paradox through which, like the prophet Jonah, he was being carried to his ultimate destination. Though his early monastic writings describe a feeling of giddy homecoming, his later journals tell a different story. Irritation with the banal business operations of the monastery, conflicts with his abbot, frustrations with a religious system that seemed determined to stifle his yearnings for a life of solitary prayer. In his early years, he was beset by the notion of joining a purer order, the Carthusians or the Comaldolese, 
This later gave way to fantasies of fleeing to a hermitage or a community in Mexico, Nicaragua, Chile, the Virgin Islands, New Mexico, or Alaska, seemingly anywhere but Gethsemane. Inevitably, these plans were quashed by his superiors if they had not already been displaced by newer schemes. In light of such first frustrations, he could write, I think the monastic life as we live it here warps people, kills their spirit, reduces them to something less than human. He proclaims to his journal, it's intolerable to have to spend my life contributing to the maintenance of this illusion, the illusion of the great, gay, joyous, peppy, optimistic, Jesus-loving, 100% American Trappist monastery. <laughs> the time he wrote that, he was the uh, master of novices. <laughs> Eventually, Merton realized that he didn't need to leave Gethsemane. What he really wanted was greater interior space to define the meaning of his contemplative vocation. It was not a call to leave the monastery, but to rediscover its meaning. Quote, it does not much matter where you are as long as you can be at peace about it and live your life. The place certainly will not live my life for me. I have to live it for myself. Where would he find the solitude he sought? Quote, here or there makes no difference. Somewhere, nowhere, beyond all where, solitude outside geography or in it, no matter. At this point, after years of clamoring for a more solitary life, Merton was given permission to live in a simple hermitage on the monastery grounds, a situation that proved conducive to both prayer and creative work. Happily, he wrote, the sense of a journey ended, of wandering at an end, the first time in my life I ever really felt that I had come home and that my roaming and looking were ended. In the pure silence and solitude of the hermitage, Merton felt he was making his own kind of protest against a world in which communication had been replaced by party platforms and advertising slogans, in which time and existence itself were measured out and weighed for their productive value. As a spiritual explorer, he felt a special connection with the Desert Fathers of the fourth century, who had left the comforts and compromises of a supposedly Christian world for the solitude of the wilderness. In words that really applied to himself, he wrote, what the Desert Fathers sought most of all was their own true self in Christ. And in order to do this, they had to reject completely the false, formal, self-fabricated, self-fabricated under social compulsion in the world. They sought a way to God that was uncharted and freely chosen, not inherited from others who had mapped it out beforehand. We need to learn from these men of the fourth century how to ignore prejudice, defy compulsion, and strike out fearlessly into the unknown. Merton himself, of course, was seeking a way to God that was uncharted and freely chosen, not inherited from others who had mapped it out beforehand. Unfortunately, there are risks to be faced by those who travel without maps. The solitary desert explorers whom Merton admired faced many such perils in the form of temptations. The same was true for Merton. It was soon after settling into his hermitage that he faced his own final and most difficult temptation. I refer to his falling in love and conducting a secret affair with a nurse he met in, in the hospital in Louisville. This episode, which lasted over a period of several months, is described in great detail in volume six of his published journals. It's a story too complex to summarize adequately, but suffice to say that this affair, in this affair, Merton experienced a liberating sense of his capacity to love and receive love. His journal is by turns deeply moving, heartbreaking, and also exasperating. Some, of her, some have romanticized the episode, feeling that he should have, as one of his poet friends put it, follow the ecstasy right out of the monastery. That was a serious option. What was not an option was to have it both ways, to suppose that there was some way to be both a hermit and a lover. What was at stake was not simply the violation of his monastic vows, but a kind of doubleness and lack of integrity. What do I fear most? Forgetting and ignorance of the inmost truth of my being. To forget who I am, to be lost in what I am not, to fail my own inner truth, to get carried away in what is not true to me. When he was honest with himself, he realized that he was ultimately wedded to his vocation to solitude. Regarding his vows, he wrote, I cannot be true to myself if I am not true to so deep a commitment. 
he came to the conclusion that his vocation was not just for himself, but that it meant something to the rest of the world. Quote, vocation is more than just a matter of being in a certain place and wearing a certain kind of costume. There are too many people in the world who rely on the fact that I am serious about deepening an inner dimension of experience that they desire that is closed to them, and it is not closed to me. This is a gift that has been given to me, not for myself, but for everyone. I cannot let it be squandered and dissipated foolishly. It would be criminal to do so. In effect, he returned to the idea that had first attracted him to the abbey, that the monastery was in some sense the axis mundi, that the monks were in some way with their prayers and their faithfulness, keeping the world turning. But now he was understanding faithfulness, not just in terms of an outward form or a particular setting, but in terms of the deepest core of himself. The difference suggested that this was not some special vocation for Trappist monks. Wherever people did this, wherever they were faithful to their true selves, they were the axis mundi, standing up for peace against lies, in the integrity of their witness, in creating something beautiful and true, in their loving service of their neighbors. For some, this might be in a soup kitchen, a studio, a marriage, a prison cell. For him, it was in his hermitage. On September 10th, 1966, he signed a short formula in which he committed himself, quote, to live in solitude for the rest of my life. He continued to be carried toward his true destiny in the belly of a paradox, traveling without maps, stumbling in the dark, but trusting that he was being guided toward his true home. In 1968, the last year of his life, a more flexible abbot permitted him at last to venture forth. He accepted an invitation to address an international conference of Christian monks in Bangkok. Merton was particularly excited about the prospect of exploring his deep interest in Eastern spirituality. In this respect, as his journals show, the trip marked a new breakthrough, another wider encounter with the gate of heaven that is everywhere. He met with Buddhist and Hindu monks. In India, he had several significant meetings with the Dalai Lama. He records in his journal many significant dreams that refer to his need to get to the other side of a river or to see the hidden side of a great Himalayan mountain. In Ceylon, one week before his death, in the presence of the enormous statues of the reclining Buddha, he was, quote, suddenly, almost forcibly jerked clean out of the habitual half-tied vision of things and an inner clearness, clarity, as if exploding from the rocks themselves became evident and obvious. Everything is emptiness, and everything is compassion. It was the culmination of his Asian pilgrimage. Quote, I mean, I know and have seen what I was obscurely looking for, and perhaps it was something more. On December 10th, he delivered his talk in Bangkok and afterward retired to his room for a shower and nap. In this talk, in the last hour of his life, he spoke of the monastic principle of conversatio morum, what he called the most mysterious, and yet most essential of all monastic vows. He interpreted it as, quote, a commitment to total inner transformation of one sort or another, a commitment to become a completely new man. It seems to me that that could be regarded as the end of the monastic life, and that no matter where one attempts to do this, that remains the essential thing. A short while after delivering this talk, he was found dead in his room, apparently electrocuted by the faulty wiring of a fan. In Merton's writings, there are many foreshadowings of this end. In his early journal, The Sign of Jonas, he concludes with a tour of the monastery during a nighttime fire watch, ending in the belfry, where he imagines his hand on the door, quote, through which I see the heavens. The door swings out upon a vast sea of darkness and of prayer. Will it come like this, the moment of my death? Will you, that's to God, open a door upon the great forest and set my feet upon a ladder under the moon and take me out among the stars. Likewise, he had concluded the seven-story mountain with a mysterious speech in the voice of God in which he contemplated his end. Do not ask when it will be or where it will be or how it will be on a mountain or in a prison, in a desert or in a concentration camp or in a hospital or a Gethsemane. It does not matter, so do not ask me because I'm not going to tell you you will not know until you are in it, but you shall taste the true solitude of my anguish and my poverty 
and I shall lead you into the high places of my joy, and you shall die in me and find all things in my mercy, which has created you for this end. In a similar spirit, Henry Nouwen contemplated his own end. Standing in a crowded lecture hall in this very school, he wrote the date of his birth, 1932, followed by a short line to another date, 2010, which was followed by a question mark. This could represent my life, he told the audience, a finite period with a beginning and an end. Neither he nor his students, of course, could guess how much shorter the actual line would be. Then he shook his head. Returning to the blackboard, he drew a line from one end of the blackboard all the way across to the other. Then he said, I have come from somewhere, and I am going someplace. Nouwen was not a monk, though part of him wanted to be. Probably St. Benedict would have included him among what he called derisively the gyratory monks, who restlessly wander in different countries, staying in various monasteries for three or four days at a time. Nevertheless, like Merton, Nouwen appreciated the meaning of conversatio morum, what Merton called the most necessary of monastic vows, the ongoing struggle to go more deeply into the heart of one's vocation. Nouwen, like Merton, was a spiritual explorer who invited his readers to accompany him on a journey ever deeper into the heart of the divine mystery. Where that was ultimately calling him, he was not sure. Through his doubts, sufferings, and restless searching, he clung in faith to the confidence that our origins and our destination are hidden in the mystery of God. That being so, our task in this life, whether it is long or short, whether heavy with sorrows, light with blessings, or a combination of the two, is to find the path that conveys us toward that goal. Whether Henry found the home he was seeking is something he alone knows. But in his prolific writings, as much as Merton, he left a trail for fellow seekers. Henry Nouwen came to the United States in 1964 to study psychology and spiritual direction, and he stayed on to teach at a number of distinguished schools, Notre Dame, Yale Divinity School, Harvard Divinity School. By the time of his passing 32 years later in 1996, he had become one of the most popular and influential spiritual writers in the world. His popularity was only enhanced by his willingness to share his own struggles and brokenness. He did not present himself as a spiritual master, but like the title of one of his early books, A Wounded Healer. Those who knew him were aware of how deep the wounds ran. He was afflicted by an inordinate need for affection and affirmation. He was beset by anxieties about his identity and self-worth. There seemed to be a void within that could not be filled. He had a great gift for friendship, and wherever he went, he sowed the seeds of community. But still something drove him from one project or place to another, from Holland to America, from Notre Dame to Yale to a Trappist monastery, where he spent a sabbatical as a guest monk, an experience he described in his first breakthrough book, Genesee Diary. Undoubtedly, he was drawn there in part by his early attraction to Merton. They had met one time at Gethsemane, though it seems that Merton, possibly having trouble with Henry's accent, didn't really get his name. He refers in his journals to a pleasant talk with a father now, N-A-U. Though I like the sort of Eckhart Tolle sort of, um, you know, N-O-W there too, maybe father now, from Holland. Now and shared a bit of Merton's restless nature as he indicated in the introduction to the Genesee Diary. My desire to live for seven months in a Trappist monastery, not as a guest but as a monk, did not develop overnight. It was the outcome of many years of restless searching. I kept stumbling over my own compulsions and illusions. What was driving me from one book to another, one place to another, one project to another? Unfortunately, as he acknowledged in the conclusion of his diary, written six months after leaving Genesee, it had been an illusion to think that he would emerge from this experience, quote, a different person, more integrated, more spiritual, more virtuous, more compassionate, more gentle, and more joyful. He traveled to the missions in Latin America, an experience he described in his diary, Gracias, and contemplated becoming an affiliate of Marinol. Recently, I gave a retreat at Marinol uh, and was attended by the former superior general of Marinol from that time. He described how Henry had come to him and asked him about this idea of affiliating with Marinol. 
And he had said he had advised Henry that wasn't a good idea, he didn't think. And he said he'd always wondered whether that was good advice. And I said, Father, that was 100% correct advice. <laughs> Eventually, Henry ended up at Harvard Divinity School. This came after a big celebration at Genesee to celebrate his jubilee as a priest, which I attended. He was thinking that Genesee would be his base of operations, and he publicly thanked the abbot for giving him a true home at last. The next week, Henry called and said he was thinking of coming to Harvard. <laughs> but I thought that Genesee was going to be your home, I said. Well, he said, the abbot thinks that maybe that's not such a good idea. <laughs> so he came to Harvard, where he quickly felt out of place. His lectures attracted enormous crowds, but the celebrity only underlined his abiding sense of loneliness and isolation. Later he wrote about, with feeling about the temptations that Christ suffered in the desert to be relevant, relevant, powerful and spectacular. Behind all this restlessness was an underlying effort to hear God's voice, to find his true home, and to know where he truly belonged. At this point there came a great turning point in his life. Over the years, Nouwen had visited a number of L'Arche communities in France and Canada. And at a time when he was feeling at himself at a dead end at, at Harvard, Jean Vanier invited him to spend a year living at the L'Arche community in France. And I think the deal was sealed for Henry when Vanier said, maybe we can offer you a home here. That, Henry wrote, more than anything else was what my heart desired. In The Road to Daybreak, Henry's journal of that year, he wrote movingly of his efforts to adjust to his new home. This is the first day of my new life, he begins his diary. And indeed, it was a year of tremendous growth, though marked, as he made it clear, by the same old struggles with rejection, his extreme sensitivity, his propensity to fill every moment with projects and busyness. A priest to whom he shared his restlessness told him the obvious. The issue is not where you are, but how you live wherever you are. That had not changed by the end of his time there. I am still the restless, nervous, intense, distracted, and impulse-driven person I was when I set out on this spiritual journey. Duh. <laughs> he still had a long way to go. In 1986, during his year abroad, he received a formal invitation from Daybreak, the large community in Toronto, to become their pastor. It was the first time in his life he had received such a formal call. With trepidation, he accepted, and Daybreak became his home for the last 10 years of his life. It was unlike anything he had ever known. Nowen had written extensively about community, but he had never really known community life. That was the change at daybreak, but it was a struggle. A man of great intellectual gifts, he was physically clumsy and was challenged by such everyday tasks as parking a car or making a sandwich. In my first encounter with Henry Nowen, when I was a 20-year-old editor of the Catholic Worker, I had the nerve to reject an article by Henry on community judging that it was too abstract. <laughs> Ten years later, when I told him I'd been offered the job at Orbis, he remembered that day, and that early rebuff. <laughs> <clears throat> he told me that he intellectually he thought I was perfect for the job, but he didn't know whether I had the human gifts <laughs> for this line of work. At daybreak, Henry may have assumed he would be concerned chiefly with pastoral tasks, but like other members of L'Arche, he was assigned to care for one of the handicapped residents. In fact, one of the most severely handicapped adults in the community, a young man named Adam, who could not talk or move by himself. Now and spent hours each morning simply bathing, dressing, and feeding Adam. Some of his old admirers wondered whether Henry Nowen was not wasting his talents in such menial tasks. But to his surprise, he found this an occasion for deep inner conversion. Adam was not impressed by Nowen's books or his fame or his genius as a public speaker. <clears throat> but through this mute and helpless man, Nowen began to know what it meant to be beloved of God. This was not, of course, the end of his struggles. After his first year at daybreak, Nowen suffered a nervous breakdown, the culmination of long suppressed tensions. For months, he could barely talk or leave his room. Now he was the helpless one, mutely crying out for some affirmation of his existence. <clears throat> As he later described it, everything came crashing down. My self-esteem, my energy to live and work, my sense of being loved, 
my hope for healing, my trust in God, everything. It was an experience of total darkness, a bottomless abyss. During these months of anguish, he often wondered if God was real or just a product of his imagination. But later he wrote, I now know that while I felt completely abandoned, God didn't leave me alone. With the support of his friends and intensive counseling, he was able to break through and to emerge more whole, more at peace with himself. Above all, he emerged with a deeper trust in what he called the inner voice of love, a voice calling him, quote, beyond the boundaries of my short life to where Christ is all in all. In 1995, he began a sabbatical year from his work as chaplain at daybreak. What will I have learned when I finally reach the other end, he asked himself in his deeply revealing journal. In typical, now in fashion, it proved to be an extremely busy sabbatical, filled with constant travel, meetings, and intense work. In the summer of 1996, he was working hard, struggling to complete five books. To many friends, he seemed happier and more relaxed than they had ever seen him, talking with great enthusiasm of his coming 65th birthday and plans for the future. Thus it came as a great shock when he suddenly died of a heart attack on September 21st while passing through Amsterdam on his way to work on a documentary in St. Petersburg. There were numerous ironies at play in this death, the culmination of a sabbatical year. Among these were the fact that a man so much afflicted by a sense of homelessness throughout his life should die in his home country, surrounded in the end by his 90-year-old father and his siblings, the subject of his planned documentary was his favorite painting, Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. But perhaps the surprise should not have been so great. Nouwen's posthumously published sabbatical journey contains abundant evidence of the terrible fatigue that was tugging at his sleeve, even as a restless energy pushed him forward with plans and projects in the quest for deeper answers. It's hard to believe he was not headed for some culminating experience, whether breakthrough or collapse or both. Before setting out, his friend Nathan actually asked what they should do in case of his death, a strangely prescient question for a man who was only 63. Nowen said that he wanted to assure his friends of his gratitude for his life, and he would repeat those same words to Nathan the night before his death. In fact, Nowen's writings from the past years of his life make it clear how much he had contemplated and prepared for this particular homecoming. In one journal entry, he wrote, how much longer will I live? The only thing seems clear to me, only one thing, every day should be well lived. What a simple truth, still it is worth my attention. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentments? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. I must trust that the little bit of love that I sow now will bear many fruits here in this world and in the life to come. These were not random thoughts, but the reflections of a man who had devoted unusual attention to the prospect of his own death and had adjusted his entire existential attitude accordingly. The central question was not how much time remains, but rather how to prepare for death so that, quote, our dying will be a new way for us to send our and God's spirit to those whom we have loved and who have loved us. A particular catalyst for Nowen's reflections came after his move to Daybreak community when he was nearly killed in a traffic accident. He was walking along a busy highway one wintry day, his mind as usual on other things, and he was struck by the side view mirror of a passing van. Although it seemed at first that he had suffered only a few broken ribs, it emerged that his internal injuries were life-threatening. But in the hours that followed, as his life hung in the balance, something else happened. As he later wrote, I hesitate to speak simply about Jesus because of my concern that the name of Jesus might not evoke the whole full presence that I'd experienced. It was not a warm light, a rainbow, or an open door that I saw, but a human yet divine presence that I felt inviting me to come closer and to let go of all my fears. As a result, what was on the one hand a terrifying ordeal was also one of the most comforting events in his life. Death lost its power, he wrote, and shrank away in the life and love that surrounded me in such an intimate way as if I were walking through a sea whose waves were rolled away. I was being held safe while moving toward the other shore. All jealousies, resentments, and angers were being gently moved away. 
and I was being shown that love and life are greater, deeper, and stronger than any of the forces I had been worrying about. Anyone familiar with Nouwen's propensity to worry, which is to say any reader of his previous books, <laughs> would comprehend the immensity of this statement. In receiving the gift of peace, Nouwen felt commissioned to share his new awareness with others. Having touched eternity, he now wondered whether the extra years were not given so that he could, quote, live them from the other side, to look at the world from God's perspective, and, quote, to help others to do the same without their having to be hit by a mirror of a passing van. In previous books, Nouwen had thought that our lives belonged to others besides ourselves, but now he perceived that this insight applies to our deaths as well. If we die with guilt, shame, anger, or bitterness, all of that becomes part of our legacy to the world, binding and burdening the lives of our family and friends. It is possible, on the other hand, to regard our dying as a gift, an opportunity to pass along to others our own sense of peace in God. In many talks on this theme, Nouwen drew on an image taken from his lifelong fascination with the circus. In his later years, Nouwen had developed a particular friendship with the Flying Rodleys, a troupe of trapeze artists whom he first encountered in a circus in Holland. For a time, he even entertained the idea of uh, joining them on the road, and he filled notebooks with his detailed jottings on every aspect of their craft. He thought about writing a book about the Flying Rodleys, believing that in their artistry he might find a new vocabulary for the spiritual life. He had been particularly fascinated by a remark from one of the flyers, the seeming stars of the Trapeze Act, who told him that in fact, the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. As he explained, when I fly to the catcher, I have simply to stretch out my arms, my hands, and wait for him to catch me and pull me safely over the apron behind the catch bar a flyer must fly, and a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust with outstretched arms that his catcher will be there for him. In the circus wisdom, Henry found a message of great power and consolation. So often we measure our identity and success by how well we remain in control. But in the end, the final meaning of our lives may be determined by our capacity to trust, to let go, to place ourselves in the hands of another. In this light, he recalled the words of Jesus on the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Dying, he reflected, is trusting in the catcher. In the last months of his life, Henry was shaken by a particular death in the daybreak community. It was Adam, the severely handicapped young man whom he had cared for during the first year after his arrival at daybreak. Adam, who had helped him learn so late in his own life what it means to be beloved of God. Finally, after a lifetime of illness and disability, Adam had succumbed to his ailments at the age of 34. For the Larsh community, which regards its handicapped members as its core, Adam's death was a devastating loss. Henry rushed back to Toronto from his sabbatical year to share the grieving of Adam's family and friends. Compared to, say, Henry Nouwen, Adam had accomplished nothing, not even the routine tasks that most people take for granted. He could not speak or dress himself or brush his own teeth. In the eyes of the world, the question would not have been why such a man should die, but why God in the first place permitted him to live. And yet now and saw in Adam's life and death a personal reenactment of the gospel story. As he wrote, Adam was very simply, quietly, and unquietly there he was a person who, by his very life, announced the marvelous mystery of our God. I am precious, beloved, whole, and born of God. Adam bore silent witness to this mystery, which has nothing to do with whether or not he could speak, walk, or express himself. It has to do with his being. He was and is a beloved child of God. It is the same news that Jesus came to announce. Life is a gift. Each one of us is unique, known by name, and loved by the one who fashioned us. Jesus, too, had accomplished relatively little during his short public life. He, too, had died as a failure in the world's eyes. Still, Nouwen wrote, both Jesus and Adam are God's beloved sons, Jesus by nature, Adam by adoption, and they lived their sonship among us as the only thing they had to offer. That was their assigned mission. That is also my mission and yours. Believing it and living from it is true sanctity. 
Now and set out to write a book about Adam. It would be his last book, as it turned out, and I would be his last editor. And as was the case with all of Nowen's best writings, it was also about himself. He seemed to sense in the passing of this young man that he was being called to prepare for his own flight into the waiting arms of the catcher. It was as, as if he wrote, Adam was saying, don't be afraid, Henry. Let my death help you to befriend yours. When you are no longer afraid of your own death, then you can live fully, freely, and joyfully. It was a voice he had heard before. In a book published the same month as his death, he had written, Many friends and family members have died during the past eight years, and my own death is not so far away. But I have heard the inner voice of love, deeper and stronger than ever. I want to keep trusting in that voice and to be led by it beyond the boundaries of my short life to where Christ is all in all. Like everyone, I was stunned to receive the news of Henry's death. He had come for dinner at my home just a few weeks before to drop off the manuscript for Adam. I had been so moved by the occasion that I, I prepared a plaque for one of his books and wrote to thank him for his years of friendship. Everything afterward was a blur. His family held a funeral mass for him in Holland and then graciously arranged for his body to be sent home for burial among the daybreak community in Toronto. I flew up for the day where I met Sue Moster for, for the first time and I saw him there for the last time in his open casket, a plain pine box decorated colorfully by the L'Arche residents. His large hands were at rest, no longer fidgeting. I was numb, unable to express any thoughts or feelings. But when I returned to work the next day, there was an envelope waiting for me in the morning mail, addressed in Henry's unmistakable hand. It was a letter he'd written 10 days before his death. Boy, oh boy, he said, that is quite a plaque. I wonder if there's a humble enough place to hang it without announcing myself too much. <laughs> he acknowledged his ungratefulness for our friendship and closed with the words, I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. It was the first sign that my relationship with Henry was not over. In concluding his book, Henry had written of Adam, is this when the resurrection began in the midst of my grief? That is what happened to the mourning Mary of Magdala when she heard a familiar voice calling her by name. That is what happened to the downcast disciples on the road to Emmaus when a stranger talked to them and their hearts burned within them. Mourning turns to dancing, grief turns to joy, despair turns to hope, and fear turns to love. Then hesitantly, someone is saying, he is risen, he is risen indeed. It'd be nice to suppose that by the end of his life, Henry had resolved all the complexities of his personality. As his book, The Sabbatical Journey, makes clear that was not really the case. I sometimes wonder how I am going to survive emotionally, he wrote. He acknowledged his inner wound, his, quote, immense need for affection and this immense fear of rejection. Probably he recognized this wound would never go away. It was there to stay. But he had come to a deep insight that perhaps this wound quote, is a gateway to my salvation, a door to glory, and a passage to freedom. I am aware that this wound of mine is a gift in disguise. These many short but intense experiences of abandonment lead me to the place where I am learning to let go of fear and surrender my spirit into the hands of one whose acceptance has no limits. From Adam, he had learned what it means to be beloved of God, which has nothing to do with our talents or our special gifts. Jesus had not chosen his disciples because of their exceptional genius or their human gifts. He simply said, come follow me. To his disciple Peter, he had said, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and lead you where you would not go. Ultimately, trusting the catcher, Henry had learned to stretch out his hands and let God carry him to the home he had never known in this body. In his famous interview in America Magazine, Pope Francis described in wonderful terms the difference between what he calls a lab faith and a journey faith. In a lab faith, God is revealed as a compendium of abstract truths. Everything is certain and mathematical. Things are black and white. But such a faith can be inflexible, deductive, abstract, ill-prepared to deal with the messiness of life and the nature of reality. 
It knows the answers in advance. It can resist the surprising action of the Holy Spirit. A journey faith, in contrast, implies an openness to uncertainty, risk, and the need for discernment, which is really about how you make your way and make decisions in the face of uncertainty. It implies growth, the possibility of conversion, the capacity to go deeper, to discover new things. With a journey faith, you don't know all the answers in advance. As Pope Francis says, our life is not given to us like an opera libretto in which all is written down, but it means going, walking, doing, searching, seeing. We must enter into the adventure of the quest for meeting God. We must let God search and encounter us. God is encountered walking along the path. God is encountered walking along the path. And as both Merton and Nowen showed, sometimes we walk that path without maps. They created their path by walking it. But in their own struggles to be faithful, they created possibilities for many others to live with greater compassion, courage, and integrity. They encountered God by walking along the path, and through their writings, they cast seeds of contemplation and communion that continue to bear fruit in diverse and unexpected places. For those of us who struggle to see the road ahead, they are welcome companions. Let me conclude with a prayer that Henry wrote four months before he died. I do not know where you will lead me. I do not know where I will be two, five, or ten years from now. I do not know the road ahead of me. But I know now that you are with me to guide me, and that wherever you lead me, even where I would rather not go, you will bring me closer to my true home. Thank you, Lord, for my life, for my vocation, and for the hope that you have planted in my heart. Amen. Robert, thank you so much. Um, it is intimidating to say the least to get up and have to follow something like that. But um, my name is Mike Lally. I am a second year student here at Yale Divinity School. And um, in, while I'm a student, I'm co-president of the Roman Catholic Fellowship here. And I'm a community member at St. Thomas More uh, Catholic Center downtown as well. Um, I've been working with the development office to help put on this, uh, th this conference. And I'm here just to offer a few brief reflections on Robert's talk, and I, I know I'm the one thing keeping you between you and your next cup of coffee, so this will be uh, brief. Um, the wanderings of Noun and Merton continue today in their messages. They continue to spread the world and cover the world in new and different ways. Uh, interestingly, most recently on late night television, um, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert recently, uh, who, is, who has taken the place of David Letterman recently. Colbert um, had a, on for a guest, a gentleman named Russell Brand. Russell Brand is an actor, comedian, musician, and Brand had kind of lived your, like, your stereotypical rock and roll life for many years, becoming um, addicted to drugs and alcohol and sex, and, had, and has recently written a book talking about overcoming those addictions. And so he was on tour, you know, um, promoting his book. And Stephen, Stephen Colbert was interviewing him and said, you know, tell me about um, what is addiction? Why do we battle addictions in today's world? And, and uh, Brand said, uh, we are individuals who, th there are individuals in the world who have a longing for truth or a longing for God even. And yet our society tells us that the only uh, the only answer to this longing we feel are materials and possessions and pleasures. And when people receive that fundamental contradicting message, they, uh, they don't know what to do with it, and so they turn to addiction. And Colbert, a faithful Catholic, like many of you know, I'm sure, uh, responded with a quote from Merton, well, a, a paraphrase from Merton. He said, yes, we, we 
as Thomas Merton said, we wrap ourselves, we clothe ourselves in the bandages of other people's perceptions, in our, uh, in our appetites or our pleasures without ever looking under it. And Russell Brand was quite taken by this and unfortunately referred to uh, Thomas as Thomas Burton with a B for the rest of the lecture, but um, I, 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 don't think, I don't think Merton would, would mind probably. Uh, it's, that, that quote from Colbert is, I think, really the, uh, the key to these wanderings of Henry and Thomas, where, uh, and I'll come back to the quote in a second, but it's this search to fulfill this deep inner question, this deep inner pain, to um, find that answer to who we truly are as to why these, and that's why these men continued their um, restless searching their entire lives. So let me read the quote in its full. I use up my life in the desire for pleasure and the thirst for experiences, for power, honor, knowledge, and love, to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real. And I wind experiences around myself and cover myself with pleasure and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible to myself and to the world, as if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covers the surface. And um, this is the question that sits on all of us, this, this, um, this searching as to how we go about pulling that bandage back and looking under it to discover our true selves. Uh, I would never presume to offer an answer to how we do that or, or the method by which we do that, especially when Henry and Thomas encountered such difficulty on that path. But um, I will just share briefly one experience that, that allowed me to look under um, my own bandages and, and um, invite others to, to do the same, hopefully. Like Henry, I was, I was blessed to have the opportunity to um, work with someone who had, be, who had who, had lost most of their faculties or didn't have their, their faculties. I, I was able in high school to briefly volunteer at a hospice center where I worked with a woman named Susan who was dying of ALS. And Susan um, had lost function of most of her body. She, she could still talk with some difficulty and could kind of turn her hands over like this but only with great struggle. And so I would feed Susan in the morning. And I did this probably four or five times and um, the last morning I was feeding her breakfast, she said, um, thank you for doing this, and you're very good at this. In, in fact, my, um, you, you're, you're, my own sister can't feed me this well. And it was a strange compliment, but an incredibly meaningful compliment, and the fact that this woman, who was, who was young, who was for, in, in her, her mid-40s, had every reason to be bitter, and angry and depressed and sad, um, and yet in the midst of her moments found some, uh, found the ability to offer a simple word of thanks and gratitude to a kid who didn't even really know what he was doing or why he was there. And that kind of grace and that type of bestowed love is something that allows you to recognize what it means to be a true individual who um, is worthy of love and is worthy of that kind of grace that, that, um, that can be given to you. I, um, there, there, it's difficult to, to conclude on, on statements like this, but I would, I would just invite you to look for those moments both in your past and then look forward to those moments in the future that allow you to pull back those bandages to allow you to understand your searchings, your wanderings. And um, maybe that, that process will allow all of us, like Merton said, to see ourselves shining like the sun. Thank you very much.